Right, so this morning we want to continue a series we started a couple of weeks ago, actually on the 30th of December. Today is part four, and we've entitled it, A Star is Born. And we're talking about relationships. The most powerful thing any one of us can experience in our lives is relationship. How many of the most powerful relationship any of us can have is our relationship with God? And that relationship with God is founded on the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to know God wants to work in your life and through your life. And he wants to connect you with the people around you so that your relationship with God and with others can be fruitful, can be prosperous, and can be powerful. So this morning we want to continue, and and our subtitle this morning is love. We want to talk about the love of God this morning. We've been building for the last three weeks in, in different areas how to love God, how to love ourselves in a godly way, and now we're going to start talking about how to love other people, but we want to start by talking about the love of God. God's love is the way to victory for the believer. If you want to live in victory, then you need to learn to live in love. We in the body of Christ need to treat one another with love. We cannot continue to mistreat people and think that we'll continue to prosper in the ways of God. We need to develop the love of God. And, you know, Paul had come to understand this. And and this morning we want to look at some of the writings of the Apostle Paul And we want to see how he addressed and how he spoke about the love of God and the love of God in our own lives. Now, Paul was an incredible apostle. He established many local churches. And in AD 50 or AD 51, he pioneered and started a church in the city of Corinth. Now, Corinth was a, was a, was a, was a powerful city, a very wealthy city. And I want you to know over the next five years, the local church in Corinth flourished. It grew to thousands. People's lives were being changed. But I want you to know that Corinth was also the hub of sexual immorality. It was the hub of prostitution. It was the hub of idolatry. And so from prison, Paul writes a letter to the elders in the congregation of Corinth. And he addresses in the two letters he writes, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he addresses eight issues that had cropped up or grown in the church that were hindering the church from growing and becoming everything God wanted it to become. And so in chapter 12, we start to notice that he addresses one of the issues. Uh, One of these eight issues was the misuse of spiritual gifts in the church. And so in chapter 12, he starts to write about spiritual gifts. He talks about the fact that there's unity in diversity. And he speaks about that we are all one together in the body of Christ. Although we have many different functions and many different uh, parts in the body, we are one and we're called to unity. Then in chapter 14, he goes on and he speaks about prophecy. And he speaks about the baptism uh, in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And he actually promotes the baptism of the Holy Spirit by making a declaration. He actually says this in chapter 14. He says, I speak in tongues more than everybody. He had realized the power of his heavenly language and how that connected him with the mysteries of God and the supernatural realm. And he talks about tongues and spiritual gifts. And then he makes a powerful statement. He says, when spiritual gifts are used in the church, they need to be used with wisdom. And what he actually speaks about is that they need to be used under the control and the governance of leadership, discernment, and order. Because anything God does, he does it with order. Hey, no, God is not disorderly. God is not confused. And so he speaks about these things. Now, here's the amazing thing. Right in the middle of these two powerful chapters, we find chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians 13. And chapter 13 has has become known as the love chapter of the Bible. And I found it so interesting that between addressing these two issues, right in the middle, in the center, he speaks about the love of God. 
I was sharing with the men at our coffee club this week that if you, if you count the verses from uh, chapter 12, verse 1, to the end of chapter 14, I think it's verse 26, there are 84 verses. And you know the middle of that, of that whole series of, of conversation that he had with the leaders in the, the church at Corinth is verse 11, which says we need to grow up and we need to mature in the love of God. And so the love of God is so important. Actually, Paul is so determined about helping the church to understand love that he ends chapter 12 by saying this, that we need to desire the spiritual gifts, but we should pursue love. In other words, we need to go after it. Uh, if you're pursuing something or someone, how many know you're going after them? I remember 10 years ago, I was pursuing Mandy. I pursued her and I got her. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, in verse 31, he says this. He speaks for about 30 verses and then he says, I want to show you a more excellent way. A more excellent way. And he starts speaking about the love of God. He then goes through the whole of chapter 13 and he starts chapter 14 and he says this. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. He wanted us to get it this morning, church, that the love of God is at the center of everything we do and everything we are. If it's in the love of God that we do things, it takes away our feelings and our emotions because you'll discover this morning that the love God was talking about is not an emotion, it's a decision. Just look at the person next to you, say, I choose to love you. I know if you're married, maybe that was difficult this morning if you had an argument. But you know, if you're going to be excellent in your life, then you're going to have to learn to walk in the love of God. Amen? So let's look at a couple of things. Firstly, we see Jesus. Jesus is love. He defines God's divine love by laying down, listen, he didn't just lay down his life, he laid down his divinity. He laid down who he was in eternity to come to earth so he could die for you and I. We all know the powerful scripture, John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So love always gives. Uh, we're going to pray for Zimbabwe later before we close today because there's chaos broken out there. And I was just thinking this morning with a, with a holy fire and zeal, uh, part of the reason why Zimbabwe is in the mess it is in is because the church never stood up and did what they were supposed to do. Now, we have friends and family that are there in the church that are doing their best they can. But when the trouble came, the church left. And in this country, we're not going to do that. Can you say amen? And I want you to know that if we're going to turn this country around, then we have to learn how to apply the love of God in our lives. And I want you to know the love of God is the most powerful thing that the believer has. It's not a mamby-pamby love that becomes a, a floor mat for everybody. Go look at Jesus. He walked in. He turned the tables over in the temple. He corrected Peter. But you know what? When you know the love of God and you're walking in the love of God, you correct people not because you're angry with them, not because you worked up with them, but because you recognize what they're doing is not good for them. Look at the person next to you. Say, I love you. With God's love. Secondly, we see Jesus not only is the expression or, or is the, the, the display of God's love to us as humankind, but secondly, I want you to know Jesus went way beyond just laying down his divinity and his love. The Bible says he imparted his love into us. <laughs> wow. In other words, this morning, you know how to love. If you're born again, you know how to love. You might have not developed it, but you know how to love. Look at Romans 5, verse 5. It says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When you got saved and the Holy Spirit came to live in you, one of the things he poured into your heart was love. And I just remembered with, with fondness and excitement and, 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 and also in a challenging way, I remembered when I first got saved, it was like 
Not only did I become a new creation, but God revolutionized my heart. God took away that hardness. God took away that edge. God took away that rebellion. When he saved me, he poured his love into me. And people I hated before, I now loved them. It, it was like my heart melted in a good way. And that's what happens when we get saved. The love of God comes into our lives. And, and I want to encourage you this morning. I, I've gone on a journey the last two weeks and I realized, where's the love, Larry? Look at the person next to you. Say, where's the love? Not Larry, but whatever their name is. Because <laughs> you see, a fruit tree that's not cultivated, pruned, and developed doesn't grow more fruit. So love doesn't just happen. You've got to pursue it. You've got to develop it. And so I want to encourage you this morning as we get into this teaching. uh, Actually, in Romans 5 verse 10, we won't read the whole account just for the sake of time. But in verse 10, he goes on. He says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, he will save us through his life. Amen. Amen. The death brought us salvation, but his life brought us his love. And when you develop the love of God in your life, it is the way to victory. And you have this morning the ability to walk in love. The third thing we see is that Paul had experienced the love of God. When God knocked him off his horse on the way to Damascus and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not only did Saul get saved, but he got filled with the love of God, and he he had such a passion for people put into his life that he lived the rest of his life serving people and serving God. And so he'd experienced the love. He experienced the love to such a point that in one of the most powerful prayers in the Bible, the thing he prays for the church more than anything else is that we'd come to know the love of God for ourselves. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's have a look at it together from verse 14. The love of God this morning is incredibly powerful and wonderful. My prayer this morning is not so much that you'll enjoy this teaching, but that while the word of God is going, that God would wash you with the water of the word in his love. Because if you capture his love this morning, it'll renew your heart, it'll refresh your life, and it'll move you to the next level in your walk with God. In verse 14, he says, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Look at the next sentence. That you be rooted and grounded in love. Paul had it, hadn't only experienced for himself, but he had realized that with, without being grounded and rooted in the love of God, your life loses its expression and its impact. You'll see that a little bit later when we jump into, into chapter 13. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the heart of God's love. You can't go under it, you can't go over it, and you can't go around it. When you hit Jesus, you hit the love of God. Can you say amen? And you know, when people bump into us, they should experience the love of God. Verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. (laughs) You and I never get to the place where we finally know the love of God because it is always ever revealing. Think about this, no matter what you're facing in your life this morning, God has more love for you. No matter what you're facing in your life, not only does God have more love for you, but he has enough love for you to extend that to what you're facing. Which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to you is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of God that works in us. Now, how many of you know we've all taught this, and I think it's, it's accurate, but it's not complete. How many of you know we all talk about God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you can ask or think according to the power, and that power is the Holy Spirit. That's correct, but it's not complete. It's not just the Holy Spirit. It's the power of love working in you by the Holy Spirit towards others. 
God will do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you can ask or think as the love of God is fulfilled and completed in your life. And you'll see why in just a moment. Let's turn now and start looking at the benefits of love. You see, why did, why did Paul pray that prayer? Because he understood when we get rooted and grounded in love, when we start to understand and receive God's love for our lives, it changes the way we look at circumstances, the way we deal with our relationships. So first, the first benefit of love this morning is God's love will ignite your faith to work. God's love in your life will ignite your faith and it'll begin to work. You'll never be able to believe or have faith in God completely or fully until you understand and begin to walk in the God kind of love. Some of us are trusting God for things in our lives and the reason those things are hindered is not because you don't have enough faith, it's because you're not mixing your faith with love. Have a look at Galatians 5 and verses 6 this morning. Uh, In the Amplified, it says this. For if we are in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but only faith activated and expressed and working through love. You see, when I start to walk in the love of God, when I start to exercise the love of God in my life, it ignites my faith. It supports my faith. It activates my faith. Why? Because faith without works is dead. And so you know what I realized again? Just for my own life, just to encourage you, I started to realize I've got to develop my my love walk again. Amen? I've got to start walking in love at another level because why? There are lots of things I'm trusting. Any of you trusting God for lots of things this year? Am I in the right church this morning? How many of you believe in God for big things this year? All right, yeah. If you want to see big things in your life, start walking in big love. Amen? And when you start to walk in love towards each other in your marriage, when you start to walk in love towards the relationships, towards the neighbors, when you start to exercise that love, you'll be amazed at how your faith starts to work. And you'll be amazed at how many things maybe you tick off your list that you no longer need to trust God for. Just saying. Number two, benefits of love. The second thing that love will do in our lives is God's love will stop strife from entering your life. God's love stops strife from entering into your life. Divine love is a peacemaker. And it will stop strife from messing with your harmony and messing with your harvest. The number two reason why our faith doesn't work and we don't see God moving in our lives or in the church the way we want to is because we allow strife. We allow, we allow strife and conflict into our lives. And when there's strife and conflict, the Bible says that's where the, where the evil one works, where he operates in confusion and he brings, if he can get you into strife, he can neutralize the power of your testimony, the power of your faith working. That's why when Mandy and I uh, are discussing something and maybe there's something she's upset about or maybe there's something I'm upset about and now we're engaging in what we simply call intense fellowship, We've realized this, there's nothing wrong with some good, intense fellowship, discussing and talking about things. But the minute we step over to strife and we put on the boxing gloves, you know the best thing you can do? Walk away. Amen? Go into your room and start shadow boxing. I don't mean put a picture on the wall of the person. I'm talking about shadow boxing with the enemy. Give him a blue eye, but listen... Praying in tongues for six minutes. Oh, I just love Mandy. Oh, rabababai. And you know, you pray in tongues, you worship God, and it's amazing how that anger and that strife is turned, and God suddenly can either turn your heart, turn your partner's heart, or turn both your hearts. You come back, you talk about it, you say, you know what? This is what we're going to do. And guess what happened? The plan the enemy had to bring strife and conflict in to neutralize your unity and your power of agreement has now been stayed. And guess what? God can work in that situation. Amen. Look at the person next to you. Say, that is good preaching. 
1 Peter verse 4, sorry, 1 Peter 4 verse 8 says this, and above all things, please notice the terminology, above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sin. (laughs) Go think about that. Love will cover a multitude of sin. Nothing we do in our lives should contribute to someone else's pain or downfall because love gives us the strength to walk beyond that. Let me read it in the, in the Passion Translation and I'll read verse seven as well. Since we are approaching the end of all things, be intentional, be purposeful, be self-controlled so that you can be given to prayer. How many of you can see what prayer involves? Prayer involves being intentional, purposeful, and self-controlled. And above all, constantly echo God's intense love for one another. For love will be a canopy over a multitude of sins. Wow. Isn't it amazing how the writer, even Peter, connects prayer with love? You see, because when you love, you're able to have a clean heart and a pure heart in terms of the things you need to be doing and the things you need to be praying for. And when your heart is pure, you can correct things, you can deal with things, you can address things with a spirit of love. When, When Jesus turned to Peter and said, Satan, get behind me, he wasn't angry with Peter in the sense of, you're irritating me now, get out of my sight. He was realizing that what he was thinking and the way he was acting did not line up with the word and the will of God, and it was going to take Peter out. So when he corrected him, he did it from a spirit of love. Number three, benefits of love. God's love will cast fear out of your life. God's love will cast fear. I love, I love the word. It'll cast fear out of your love. It'll drive it out of, your, out of your life and out of your heart because God's love overcomes fear. Now, I don't know whether any of us will ever be perfect in loving others. <laughs> I think it's a journey, and I think we've got to keep working at it and allowing God to work at it in our lives. But thank God we can grow in our love walk. We can grow in our love work. Now, 1 John 4, 17 to 19, it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is. So are we in this world. How are we? We're filled with the love of God, which gives us boldness. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Now, I'm not going to take too much time elaborating on this because we're going to do a teaching in a few weeks on the fear of God. But the amazing thing is this, that that this helps me so much, is firstly, if I'm in fear about something, I'm not receiving the love of God. So the first thing I can do before I address the fear is say, Lord, let me receive your love in this area of my life. Because if I receive the love of God, it gives me a confidence and a peace that whatever it is that I'm fearing, God is bigger than it. Amen? Amen. Secondly, it tells me that, that that fear does not come from God. Amen? And so I know that that's something that I need to address and deal with in my life. And if I allow the love of God in my life, and, and, and then I'm able to grow. The other thing as well is if, if I'm fearing, it means there's an area in my life that I haven't received or been fulfilled in God's love. So I can grow in that area. Amen? Amen? And so sometimes just by not focusing on the fear and focusing on what I'm trusting God to do in me helps me already to overcome that fear because God's love is working. Number four, the fourth benefit of love this morning is that love in my life, God's love, and God's love is known in the Greek as agape, God's love will give our lives and our relationships a stability. God's love will bring a stability, and not just a stability, but it'll actually bring a consistency into my life. You see, when when I'm stable in my relationship, it draws people towards me. You see, God's love never fails. 
It is better to do something good for people who wrong us rather than to do something back towards them. Do something good for people who wrong you because when you do that, you allow God into the situation. Amen? You see, before you were good, before you were saved, the Bible says you were a sinner. Christ came and died for you. And so when we emulate God, when we emulate Christ in our lives and we walk in love towards other people and we are deliberate about doing good to people who do bad to us, you allow God into that situation and you are able to remain stable and constant. Number five, the fifth benefit of God's love in my life is God's love will protect your heart. God's love will protect your heart and it will keep your heart tender and it will keep your heart in the right place before God. You see, you and I can pray until we blew in the face that God would give us more love. But God's love is never increased through prayer. God's love is increased by feeding on God's love. So when you pray for God to give you more love, God sends problems into your life. <laughs> Some of you are going to stop praying for love straight away. (laughs) Because you see, fruit isn't given, it's developed, it's cultivated. God gave you the seed of love into your spirit when you got saved. Every one of us here this morning have had the love of God poured into our hearts. So the way that fruit grows is by making a choice. Leaving here today saying, you know what, from today, I'm going to develop the love of God in my life. And so love will protect your heart. Love will keep you connected with the vine, connected with God, so that your life continues to flourish even when bad things happen. We can feed the love of God in our hearts on God's word. We can begin to exercise it and it will grow because love is a fruit of the spirit. That's why love can be developed and love can grow. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest ways to grow the love of God in your life is to make a a decision and take on Larry's 30-day challenge. Read 1 Corinthians 13 every day for the next 30 days. Okay, let me just check. Let Let me go about this a different way. Is there anyone here today, your love is perfect? Just raise your hand. Then you can come and take over the preaching this morning. Anybody here, your love is perfect? Let me put my hand down as well. The only reason I'm preaching on love today is because of the grace of God. Okay, so none of us are. So because your love is not perfect, you are going to take on the Larry 30-day challenge. Amen? And every day for the next 30 days, just take five minutes and read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 out aloud. This is what you're going to do on day one. That'll be this afternoon before you go to bed you, or before you have your afternoon nap. You're going to read 1 Corinthians 13 out loud, the way it was written by Peter. Then tomorrow morning, you're going to get up and you're going to read 1 Corinthians 13 and you're going to insert Jesus wherever you see the word love. Amen. And then on day three, you're going to get up and you're going to insert your name where you inserted Jesus' name where love was. And you're going to say, Larry is full of the love of God. And you're going to read that out aloud every day for the next 30 days. And then on day four, you're going to start again reading it the way Peter wrote it. Because if you'll do that, and you'll make it into a prayer, and you'll confess it as a lifestyle over your life, you'll watch how your love walk starts to grow. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we'll look at a few things this morning as as we start to conclude our teaching for this morning. We start in verse 1, and we read the first three verses. Paul, Paul now gets into the heart of the message. He says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. In other words, he says, when you speak and the love of God doesn't fill your heart, you're just a noise. Just look at the person next to you. Say, you're just a noise. Oh, no, don't say that. Just, just rather say, I see the love of Jesus in you. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries, and I have all knowledge, though I have all faith, even faith that will move mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. So all the spiritual giants in the church, it's awesome if you're a spiritual giant, but if you don't have love, 
you're nothing. Verse 3. And even if I give all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. I mean, we could just stop there. How many you know that already puts love on a high priority for the believer? But let's break it down and see how love leads to victory. Look at some practical ways. I've learned this in my life. I don't always get it right. How many you know you can learn some things that you don't apply yet? I've learned this, but I haven't always applied it, and I want to do it more. But I've learned this. When people do things against you, when people say things against you, don't try and defend yourself because it will hinder your walk of love. You know what you must do? When people criticize you, don't retaliate, pray for them. Don't look for revenge. Revenge belongs to the Lord. Take them to God in prayer and speak life and healing because criticizing and retaliating takes you out of walking in love. Amen? And you and I should make a decision. We're not gonna allow anything to take us out of walking in love. Verse four goes on and says this. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. On on day two, you'll read it like this. Jesus suffers long and is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not parade itself and is not puffed up. On day three, you'll read it like this. Larry suffers long and is kind. Larry does not envy. Larry does not parade himself, and Larry is not puffed up. Amen? Now, I know that last part will come back to haunt me sometime this week, but I'm going to just trust God. I won't retaliate. Can you say amen? You see, some of us today, because we think the way the world thinks, we think it's a weakness when we take no account of an evil done to us. We think it's weakness when we pay no attention to a suffered wrong. But I want to encourage you this morning, if you're a believer, if you're a believer this morning, the strongest and most powerful thing you can do is to take no account of an evil done to you. Why? Because you're walking in the love of God. And the love of God will keep you connected with the power of God, which will keep you connected to the answers you are trusting God for in your life. Let's go to verse 5. Are you getting some help this morning? All right, verse five, we're gonna read it from the Amplified. It says this, love is not rude. Love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked. It is not overly sensitive and easily angered. Oh my Lord, this verse got the best of me. It is not overly sensitive, it's not easily angered. It does not take an account Oh, sorry, it's in Amplified it says it does not take into account a wrong endured. The God kind of love does not insist on its own rights. Whenever we contend for our rights or our way, we need to take a moment and make sure that we're not getting out of our love walk. Now, there is a place sometimes where you've got to stand for what's right and what's just, but then you need to do it from an attitude and a heart of love. Not from a heart and attitude of wanting to get for yourself what is due to you. One of the greatest characteristics of divine love is that it never takes an account of a suffered wrong. Our flesh would rather hear something different. But I'm obliged to preach the word. Can you say amen? Even if I'm not living it completely yet. This is the goal. This is where you and I are striving for. In 1 Corinthians 13 verse verse 6, it goes on and it says, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Church, we should get happy when the truth prevails. We should be happy when other people do well. We should be happy when we see people successful and and walking in the blessing of God and experiencing answers to prayer. Why? Because it's a good thing. That is part of the love walk. If God can do it for them, he can do it for us. Amen? And so we can rejoice and we can be happy. Verse seven, I wanna read verse seven in the Amplified. It says, love bears all things regardless of what comes. Love believes all things. It looks for the best in every person. It hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. It endures all things without weakening. God's love is ever ready to believe the best of every person. 
Since God's love believes the best in every person, listen, God believes the best of you. Amen? God doesn't look at you this morning and say, look at that miserable little tyke. Can you believe we saved that little miserable so-and-so? I wish we hadn't saved him. Did you see how he behaved this week? No, God looks at you through Jesus and he says, my, look at that champion of faith. He fell this week, but isn't it amazing? Grace will pick him up. He went to church this morning. He's getting filled with the Holy Ghost. He's hearing a great message on love. And although he's cringing right now, he's going to leave you built up, edified, and he's going to get his love walk back on track. Hallelujah. Amen. The love of God sees the best in us and brings out the best in us. Sometimes we've got to evaluate, why am I doing this? Am I just doing this because I'm seeking my own out of this situation? Or am I thinking about what's best for the other person? Because that's how the love of God operates. And you know, the best way, the best way for you and I to grow, to love ourselves and to love God and others is to forget about ourselves. And just say, God, you take care of my life and I'll walk in obedience to what you've told me to do. And you'll be amazed at what that unlocks in your life, the potential that it brings when you and I put other people ahead of our own interests and allow the love of God to rule in our lives. Verse 8 actually goes on and it says this, the love of God never fails. I love that. That's one of my most favorite verses in the world. What does it say there? Love of God never fails. Prophecies will fail. Tongues will stop. Knowledge will vanish away. But the love of God never fails. You know, I always say this, and I, and I know a lot of people say this, and it is the truth, that you can take nothing with you to heaven except other people. But you know what you do get to take to heaven? The character of God that you've developed in your life. Amen? The fruit of the Spirit you've developed in your life will go with you into heaven. And some of us who haven't developed the fruit, well, the reality is just in a natural way, you will get into heaven. If you're born again and you made Jesus the Lord of your life, you will get into heaven. But who knows what part of heaven you'll be in. (laughs) Amen? Because we'll receive rewards according to what we've done with Jesus since we got saved. So let's get busy developing the fruit. Look at John 1 verse 17 in the New Living Testament. It says this, for the law of Moses was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love, God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. And then finally today, you can go read the other few verses, but in in verse 13, it says, now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Love trumps faith, love trumps hope, love, while the other two are very important, especially here on this earth, the love of God is the greatest of all of them. In the Amplified, it says this in brackets, love is that unselfish love we have for other people which grows out of God's love for us. So as we experience God's love this morning, as we recognize that God loves us, it releases us to love other people with an unselfish love. When you love someone, you start to think about what is best for them and not just what is the best for you. The new, you know, the New Testament Christians revolutionized the word love. Do you know in most Greek transcripts, the word love that the Christians used and, and, and expressed and lived isn't even mentioned in most of the Greek transcripts because the Christians took it to a whole nother level. Just say that with me, a whole nother level. Come on, let's say that together. One, two, three. A whole nother level. And we as Christians, you know, the, the solution to this nation's problems is not some master plan. It's the church rising up and displaying the love of God, loving each other in the church, walking in unity, building 
something that is remarkable, not for what we get out of it, but because it will glorify God. Amen. And I said to our volunteers this morning, that's why this church needs to keep growing. That's why we need to be reaching more people for Christ. That's why we want to go into, into the communities, the highways and the byways, and we want to preach the gospel of good news. That's why we want to start satellite churches. That's why we want to do feeding schemes. Why? Because if we go with the message of Christ, if we go with the love of God, the way you change this nation is one person at a time, bringing them into a relationship with Jesus. Because a relationship with Jesus will change people. This is what Christian love is. It's an undefeatable goodwill towards other people. A love that gives freely out of decision, not out of emotion. The truth is, and I want to I say this with, with, with a, a genuineness and a sincerity that you'll understand. Mandy loves me. Not because she always feels like loving me. I was going to say it the other way, but that just wouldn't work. (laughs) Mandy loves me not because she feels like loving me, because there are times she doesn't feel like loving me. Don't say amen now, love. Just look forward, it's fine. (laughs) We love each other because we've chosen God's love. Over our love. You see, how does our marriage succeed? It doesn't, it doesn't succeed on emotion because there are days where I'm really feeling like, awesome. <laughs> and there are days where Manny feels like that. But the love we have goes beyond our feeling. It goes to the decision we've made to see the best in our partner because of the love of God. Not because we feel like it. Listen, feelings follow Choices. And the feelings are good and the feelings are important. We need that in our lives because we're human. I'm not, I'm not saying forget about your feelings. I'm saying make sure your feelings follow the decisions you make from your will, which is to follow God and put God first in your life. Can you say amen? The truth is this morning, a lot of times when we talk about walking in the spirit, how you know people get all mystified. Oh, brother. Oh, I'm walking in the spirit. You know, it's so mysterious and awesome, eh? Did you feel that, brother? But listen, walking in the Spirit is walking in love. When you're walking in love, you're walking in the Spirit. When you're walking in peace, you're walking in the Spirit. When you're walking in joy, you're walking in the Spirit. Now, sometimes you get a feeling and it's like, woohoo! Yeah, baby, this is amazing. But you don't go by that because the fruit of the Spirit is not governed. By emotion, it's governed by the Holy Spirit in our lives. So you can choose to walk in love this morning and it will change your life. Walking in the Spirit is walking in love and walking in love is walking in excellence and walking in excellence is walking in victory. The truth this morning is this, the love of God, the love of God will change the most vile criminal into a man or woman of God. Because the love of God breaks boundaries. It destroys bondage and it breaks the power of evil. Can you say amen? The love of God is the way to victory. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. I'm gonna ask the worship team just to come up if they would. In this moment, while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, there's just one question we want to ask ourselves first. There are two questions, but the first question this morning is, what is God through the Holy Spirit saying to me for my life this morning from this message? What one word, what scripture is the Holy Spirit tugging at my heart for? through this message. That that is God's word for you this week. That's God's word that you can stand on and rely on and trust God in. Secondly, this morning, if you're seated here while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you've never accepted Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior, then I would love the privilege to lead you in the prayer of salvation. So while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, no one looking around, if you want to be born again this morning, or you want to rededicate your life to the Lord this beautiful Sunday morning, then right where you are, no one looking around, just raise your hand and say, Pastor, 
Would you include me in that prayer? God bless you, ma'am, up front here. Thank you so much. Is there someone else who'd say, yes, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Would you please include me in that prayer? I see the hand right at the back there, sir. Thank you so much. Once you've raised it, you can put it down. Is there someone else? I see that hand over there. Thank you, young man. That is so, so wonderful. Right at the back there. God bless you, sir. God loves you this morning and he's drawing you in to a, to a relationship with him. If you, raised it, if you raised your hand or even if you didn't, but you know you wanted to, would you pray this prayer out loud with me right now? And I'm going to ask the whole church to pray with you from Romans 10 as you make Jesus the Lord of your life. Just pray this prayer out loud. Just be genuine and sincere in your heart. Say, Father God, I believe today that Jesus is your son, that he came to earth and that he died on a cross and that you raised him from the dead so that I could be saved. I receive and accept Jesus Christ into my heart as my Lord and Savior. 